Clearly, uh, the big change from since I wrote the book is that in the 10 year period, China's become a lot stronger and we no longer think of it and the world no longer thinks of it in primarily economic terms. But now sees China taking uh, the shape of, uh, of, a, of a, a major power, a great power politically, uh, 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 intellectually, culturally, militarily, and so on. Uh, and so China has arrived in, in, in a big way. And I think this is a, this is a new development. History is very important to understanding a, a country. A country is not born in the present. It's it, it, like all of us, we're shaped by our history. We are who we are, not because we're like this now, but because we've evolved over a long period since we were since we were born, actually, and countries are the same in that sense. In fact, China has never really majored on war. It's always thought of war as something to be avoided, not something to engage in. Sun Tzu regarded going to war as a kind of defeat, because the key objective is to avoid having to fight. That's so different from the American philosophy, or indeed uh, the British uh, philosophy when it, it was a great power. So I think that China is going to be a, a very different uh, to in, in its style, its approach, its priorities, its norms, its values to the Western paradigm. China's governance, contrary to Western prejudices, is a remarkably effective form of governance. It is the most developed form of governance uh, in the world. So I think that by example, but not by instruction, or by persuasion or by pressure, other countries, including Western countries, by the way, in this context, will want to learn in future from Chinese statecraft and Chinese governance, even though they will still keep very different governing systems to that you have in China. What really intrigues me the most, as a very curious kind of person mm -hmm. who enjoys the unfamiliar more than the familiar, is trying to understand the logic of China, mm -hmm. trying to understand how China thinks and how it works. Now, unfortunately, many people in the world are feel threatened by the unfamiliar. And so therefore, oh, no, I don't, that's, that, that's not like I think, and they, they retreat from it. But this is a very short term and, uh, mistaken response. You know, if we're really going to live in a world of many cultures, we have to understand each other, not at a superficial level, but at a profound level, not at a political level, because politics is full of short-term prejudices. We have to really delve into a society and really try and work out what it is. What are the, what are the key characteristics? You've got to say, this is a very Chinese project. Could you imagine any other country in the world thinking of Belt and Road? I mean, it is a grand idea on the grandest of historical stages. It's got no end point. It's completely open-ended. It's like reform and opening up. Where, 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 when does reform and opening up finish? doesn't. It's a dynamic process without, without an end point. And I think Belt and Road is exactly the same as that. So what does Belt and Road represent in this, uh, this moment? Well, I think what Belt and Road uh, has the potential to offer the world is another kind of world, another kind of set of values, another set of imperatives, another way of organizing, another set of institutions, another set of relationships. In other words, it offers an alternative to the existing international order. I mean, China lost all its uh, dignity and self-respect, really, uh, in that period, tragic period, century of humiliation. Although it's, it's longer than a century, I think. But anyway, uh, uh, and generally great countries that go into decline never recover, you know. Um, my country is at the moment going that way. You know, I think the United States is beginning to decline. In fact, one of the big stories of the second half of this century is going to be the decline of the United States. And here we have China managing since 1949 its reinvention, its reconstitution, under, undertaking an enormous transformation, a metamorphosis, an efflorescence, an extraordinary achievement, which 
as you know, is has broken new records in history, especially economically, because China is so young and is so forward-looking.